So good afternoon. Thanks for joining me. Uh, really quickly, that's who I am. Um, the only reason I'm showing this slide is because I won the jumper contest last week at our Christmas party. I mean, I, got, I had to show up. This is in the UK. I had to show up to London and show those guys how's it done, how it's done. Um, but my name is Rob Sosweta. I'm the Global Director of Digital Platform Strategy for TIBCO, formerly of TIBCO Mastery. So I do have a strong API background. And what I'm here to talk about today is Frankly, the topic of this conference, the new API stack, is bullshit. <laughs> there is no stack, right? We want to think of this as this nice, orderly set of technologies that just layer one on top of another. And in truth, we all know that's not really the way it works. And I'm pretty sure I know where this originates from. I've been around the block long enough to remember VT100 terminals and mainframes, and I remember also, you know, the first client server apps. And I really remember that when we started building web applications, we were talking about end-tier architectures. And here, it's kind of a true stack, right? There's my client, which is my browser. Eventually, it also became mobile, especially as we started tacking on APIs to our existing stack. Uh, that's just your load balancer. You can ignore that. Um, <laughs> but that's part of the stack. Then you have your presentation layer, your application layer, your data layer, right? And it was really easy to go ahead and scale this at each of the sub-tiers to scale it out back. Well, scale it horizontally, not so much vertically. It worked very nice, but we outgrew this rather quickly, especially as the number of clients started to improve and increase, and as we started to adopt APIs. So now these days, this is the kind of stack we tend to talk about. You know, uh, we've got some third-party services that live somewhere else. I don't know where they live. They live with third parties and they have their own stacks. Uh, you've got your microservices, which are basically teeny tiny stacks within your overall stack, and there's a lot more of them. And they can live in your data center, they can live in AWS, Azure, Google, Rob's really kick-ass cloud infrastructure platform provider, I don't know, they can live everywhere. And then of course you've got your legacy stuff, which more than likely still lives underneath your existing data layer, it is all there. And it's all connected nice and neatly with some kind of integration layer at top, in this case, I'm talking API management. Really clean, very comfortable. It's nice to come around and talk about this stack and tell you all about it. It's a lie. This is a lie, and you know it's a lie. Let me show you another stack. This is a lie that I have been telling for the last three or four years about the modern platform stack. Now, what's really convenient about this as, is as we have more data sources, I just add them to the top. As I have more clients, I just kind of add them to the bottom. I got this nice API management layer in the middle. It's really, really easy to talk about this, and there's a good reason I do it. Because the company I work for sells a bunch of services that fit very, very nicely into this puzzle. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that our services don't work this way. They actually work very nicely. And in fact, when you put this stuff together and you have a good infrastructure, you can actually make everything look like a stack. But this is the reality. This is when you start peeling back the onion. What you really start to see is stuff like this. Now, I took this from Istio's website. This is an example of their service mesh or their service mesh mapper. There are only nine services on here, but it's already starting to look kind of web-like, kind of messy and confusing and strange. And again, I've been around long enough that I've seen this before with point-to-point -point integrations. I love how these things have a tendency to come full circle. So this mess always freaks me out. And when I see this mess, it starts to ring that bell. Now I realize this is automated, this is controlled, it's managed, that's what Istio is supposed to do. And this was this disastrous, terrible thing where each one of these red lines was basically a hand-coded connection between them, which we solved with the enterprise service bus. And then we solved again with API management. And now we're solving again with the service mesh. We just keep telling the same story. And as this becomes more and more complex, it's going to get really, really frightening, really, really fast. This kind of terrifies me when I first look at this, because I have no idea if this dock goes down, how is this going to cascade out and affect everything else? How do I know actually what that dot is? <coughs> what services are running off of it? When you walk around the show floor today, when you walk around the show floor of all these kinds of conferences, you're seeing an entire industry rise up to try to address this. Automated management of complex service meshes of complex distributed applications. 
that's really cool when they're all kind of the same type of application. I love to tell the story about um, CRISPR. You guys know what CRISPR is? It's gene editing technology. Um, it allows you to go and cut and paste, basically, DNA. And they just had a situation where somebody, I want to say in China, actually did cut and paste the DNA and try to remove the gene that caused a particular disease in, in a child. Um, they basically gene edited a human. That's kind of scary. Um, but what's kind of also cool about CRISPR is you can actually convert binary data into DNA and you can store that in the living cells. And then you can extract that and re-encode it into binary. And it's a completely lossless operation. And they've done this. So it's possible that in the future, that dot might be some living tissue <clears throat> in your data center somewhere. Um, more realistically, distributed apps, D apps, on Ethereum. I see this as sort of the next stage in serverless. It allows me to store functions on the blockchain that can be called from practically anywhere. I can actually have the benefit of calling it from a local device that might just be down the street, might even be in my own data center. And I am paying for that compute using the native currency. I don't know where my code is going to live and I don't know how I'm gonna manage all of this. The bottom line is those neat orderly stacks, even the ones that Istio and Kubernetes and all the service mesh technologies are showing out there, they're not gonna last. We're toppling it. It's falling over and it's falling over rapidly. Don't be terrified by this embrace it. If you peel back these layers, this complexity is something that is scary at first, but it's actually not that difficult to get a handle around. And you just need to focus on a handful of key things if you want to make sure you manage this. This is probably going to be a shorter talk than I thought because I am talking fast today. So the three key concerns that I look at for distributed applications are focusing on distributed management. That really means offloading the management from some centralized server and allowing those individual services to have the, some control over their own management. That means they have control over who has access. That means that they're going to request maybe the information on who should have the right rights to work with this service by going to a, another service that tells them how to do the authentication authorization, but they should be the ones to interpret that and then decide what kind of access they should give. Distributed documentation and configuration. Each service needs to be responsible for its own configuration information, for its own documentation. And then of course you still need to have centralized management so that I know where these services are and I know how to access them. Decentralized management, one of the best ways to handle this is to let each one of your services, whether, wherever they may live, we're talking about microservices here, we're talking about there are potentially gonna be servers running off of your phone maybe they're gonna be going out there. If you've uh, got enough compute power and you're using the blockchain that's running on your phone, why not use the spare cycles? Sell those spare cycles for Ethereum coin, Lambda, or whatever serverless architecture you wanna use. And of course, devices like the Raspberry Pi, uh, whose symbol I did not wanna use in this. These are the new kinds of constructs and data sources that exist within your application structure. And they're gonna be all over the place. And I'm not showing your legacy stuff up here. I'm not showing the stuff you already have in place. I'm not showing those third-party APIs because for that, that's pretty much solved. We already have gateways for that. But for these individual smaller services, how do we distribute that management? Well, one answer that we really like is this idea of micro gateways. Very, very tiny pieces of code that can actually handle a majority of that kind of gateway access information, finding out how to authorize and authenticate, making sure you're doing whatever transformations are necessary without having to write additional code. Don't go get a library and do this. Don't hand code this yourself. Don't try to guess what people are going to want to ask of your service. Take advantage of micro gateway architectures that would handle a lot of this for you. You can submit the rules to those architectures from a centralized, a centralized access point, or you can do it at the time that you deploy it. There's all kinds of opportunities to take advantage of these micro gateways to build out that gateway functionality and offload that from some centralized management system. These adorable little birds, by the way, uh, his name is Flynn. He's part of a project called Project Flogo that Tibco sponsors. This is an open sourced flow based, okay, let's see, I always, always get this right. It's an open sourced flow based um, uh, framework written in Go. 
Now, among other things, it can do IoT, it can, it can do all kinds of great stuff, but it also does have some fantastic micro gateway capabilities. And it can produce um, executables that are uh, maybe a handful of megabytes in size. So they're not gonna really take any more, uh, too much additional space. Really, the point is it can help offload a lot of this work from you as a coder, as a developer, and really help build that gateway into your services wherever they may live, including in Amazon Lambda, including on the Raspberry Pi, including in very, very constrained services. I highly encourage you to check this out. It's a really, really fun, cool project. Now, the next step is distributed documentation and configuration. This sometimes gets a little controversial but I'm gonna stand my ground on this. Why are we not using the options header? Who here actually has implemented the options header? I'm curious. Oh, that's way more than last time. That's good, but that's still not enough. How many of here have implemented the get header? I should see every single hand up, right? If you have an API, you have implemented the get header. You've implemented the post header. This is just as important. The purpose of the options header, I've actually got the quote right here, let me see. The HTTP options method is used to describe the communication options for the target resource. That is from the spec. And what better way to do that than to go ahead and go to options and my endpoint and have it return some information in some standard that tells me exactly how to access the service. Well, there's already a standard out there that does that. We've all kind of established that it's the new standard. Guess what? It's OAI. It should return OAI. The OAI can define the servers that are available and how to access those servers, how to handle authentication and authorization. Uh, what is the data that the endpoint is going to return? It's all there, and the chances are pretty good. You've already written this for your services, but you probably have it located in some central location within your API manager or something. Your micro gateway should be able to respond to an options header with the OAI spec just for the services that that particular microservice device, whatever it does, whatever that one handles. So that when I go to that endpoint with the options header, the options method, I can get that response. And I can understand how to access it. I can understand how to configure my API management system to improve my access to it. I can send that information to my CI CD tools so it knows exactly the kinds of things it should be testing for. This helps to automate the process. And rather than storing these in one gigantic document, which by the way, sounds an awful lot like the WSDL, which was the big problem we were all trying to solve with REST anyway, why not break it up on a server by a service by service basis so that we can actually make sure that this stuff stays and lives with that service wherever it's deployed and there's no hunting that needs to happen. Now, finally, when we talk about centralized access, of course, I'm gonna talk about Tipco Mastery. Tipco Mastery is an API management solution. It was one of the first ones out there. It's uh, cloud-based with on-premise versions. Uh, so you can have it live wherever you need it to, do, to, to live. You can configure it however you need to configure it. It's actually really robust and really sweet and fun to work with. And it pays my bills, so I'm happy with that. Um, but the centralized API management is really the way of saying, how do I get to this stuff? You're going to have service-to-service -service communication. And by taking advantage of that micro gateway, you can get event-driven microservices as well, or event-driven services, without ever having to go through a central, central system. Uh, by having the, the documentation and the configuration information stored on a per-service basis, each service can query all the other services around it, get an idea of how to route, what's available, how to use it, and dynamically shift according to what those needs are. Um, but you still are going to have those people who are building applications that want to go to a single source, that single pane of glass that shows me exactly what the APIs are. And API management, centralized, lightweight management is what we need when we're talking about these massively distributed services. Right now, most API managers, including Mashery, are truly optimized to take the heavy weight of doing a majority of the API management. But in the future, as these services grow, we need to offload some of that management directly to the services themselves so that they can have some autonomy and so that you can actually create systems that can grow and adapt as your business needs change. What this means is that the stack of the future doesn't really look like a stack. The stack of the present still kind of looks like a stack because we're in the transition stage. But there's a lot of beauty in this chaos. And the question now that you have before you is as we start to approach these distributed applications as we start to grow this in our infrastructure, 
What is the best way for us to ensure that we can keep this chaos from getting out of hand? I can talk about all kinds of technological protocols. I can talk about all kinds of different systems. I can talk about Istio and Kubernetes. I can talk about the service mesh. I can talk about all these things. But at the end of the day, you really need to focus on those three things. Decentralized management, decentralized information about the services, and centralized access. And that way you can create the stack of tomorrow. That was it. Any questions?